Thank you for coming as well, especially if it's not your typical day. So thank you for making it on a Monday. Thank you for Mandy um, from uh, the Kenyan for all of the organisation behind this. And it's lovely to see Vera and Baha and people I know here, especially Ahmed, who I, ha I taught at UCL. Yes. So it's nice to see him. And it's lovely to be at REWAC because this is one of the first institutions I came to when I first visited Palestine uh, 10 years ago. So I was so impressed by the work and I do consider it part of this idea of heritage fever that I will go on to explain in a moment. Am I talking too fast? Fine. fine. Was that fine? <laughs> um, <laughs> I couldn't hear that. So I'm going to be talking about different ideas of heritage fever. I want you to consider this and to see whether you think that this is something that is a phenomena and what kind of phenomena it is. And I want to talk about it both within the idea of West Bank, Gaza, in the Palestinian diaspora, but particularly in refugee camps in Jordan that I've been working at. So... Um, I got my invitation from Ahmed in 2004 to come here. He'd studied with us in UCL and invited um, his kind of teachers to come, and I was the one who came. Um, and there are obviously entanglements as well between um, UCL, where I come from, and Palestine. Notably, in the two archaeologists, Flinders Petrie, who worked at Tel Al Adjul and other sites. Um, in Palestine, and Kathleen Kenyon, who worked at Jericho as well as um, in Jerusalem. So we have these origins, which I would say are quite, you know, double-edged. They are quite problematic in the sense that, you know, they are colonial, they are about possessing Palestine in a very kind of Orientalist mode, um, appropriating Palestine, taking objects away from Palestine. And it is very interesting on one level that the origins of the Institute were based on the idea legally that Flinders Petrie made the case that an Institute of Archaeology was needed to house what he called the Palest his Palestinian um, collection. It was homeless, which again is very <laughs> problematic. He took it, it became homeless, it needed a home and UCL was founded. So this was in 1937, um, 58 it moved into this building which Ahmed will recognise. Yes. Um, so we're interested in this idea about the future, you know, and can we rethink the relationship to Palestine of Petrie's Palestinian collection and of the collections from Kenyon as well. So that's our, that's our idea of, you know, um, what we want to do next. And I was also thinking about, and I would love to know what the connotations to you are of the idea of possessing Palestine. This is the title of the book I'm writing. And um, people have been saying to Mandy when she's been trying to translate that, that it has, a, again, a kind of double-edged idea of a kind of colonial appropriation um, or the idea of possessing as in having. So I was thinking about this idea of possession and the idea of coming to Jerusalem. So when I first came in 2004, I had a guidebook like most people. Um, and, you know, this idea of going to Jerusalem as a foreigner, as a visitor, as a pilgrim um, is very, you know, um, what's the word? Very significant. It has a very particular effect on people, whether you call, you know, it's a visit to Al Quds, Jerusalem, Zion. People see it as what I've called an encounter with efficacy. It's the idea that you're going to somewhere special that will bring around, which is you know, the mode of the pilgrim anyway. You go to a place, it's a rites of passage, you go through certain ceremonies, it's about a quest or a search, it might be moral, it might be spiritual in significance. But the idea is that you're going to sacred spaces and that the place where you've chosen is a kind of center point in some way. So the idea of the kind of um, aspiration of the pilgrim or of the traveller is that they will be transformed by their visit. They will go with you know, new knowledge, with a transformed status in some way. Um, also the idea that this is a place that promises a wholeness. So if you're fragmented, and that Karen Armstrong, the um, uh, former Catholic nun who has written a, a, a biography of... Um, uh, Jerusalem writes about this idea that it's a place where you can go and um, find wholeness and to calm the inner dis-ease, as she calls it. So I was interested in this, but also um, the idea of going to Jerusalem is about the idea of, of creating a just future. There is this idea of going there 
and you know some revelation will be there and it's about redeeming self and world and the, the idea of the just future you and your self group want. So I was interested in all of these things and then again in the first um, uh, book, uh, tourist book I ever got in 2004, I came across this, the Jerusalem syndrome. Are people familiar with this? Yeah. yeah. So I thought, oh no, this is bound to happen to me. If I go to Jerusalem, I'm bound to be found in a white sheet and you know, somebody will have to send me back to UCL. So this was basically this idea that a number of visitors going to Jerusalem every year were experiencing these episodes, which was basically a psychotic breakdown. The idea that psychosis you know, gradually develops. Um, and people were worrying it, particularly to the idea up to the millennium. They thought the millennium would cause an influx of visitors and an influx of Jerusalem syndrome. So this idea is that it develops in seven days, in seven stages, which is quite good if you're only there for the week. <laughs> um, it's well-timed. But the idea that there's anxiety, agitation, nervousness, tension, this is the first clue, but most tourists are like that, I find. Um, the desire to split away from a group, the idea that people um, engage in rituals, particularly the idea of cleansing, the obsession with bathing, compulsive um, fingernail and toenail cutting, the idea of, you know, kind of um, preparing yourself in some ritualised way, the idea of adopting a toga or a gown which is always white, and you do find some hotels in Jerusalem with a sign that warns tour, um, tour guide leaders that says, if you have one member of your, you know, kind of tour that, you know, is going to do this, please remember to bring the linen back. <laughs> you know, because it's usually white linen comes quite readily in hotels. Um, also, the idea that people feel impelled to have a procession... Oh, sorry, first of all, they feel compelled to um, take part in public recitation of psalms or verses or hymns. Also, the idea of parading, processing or marching somewhere to um, the holy places in Jerusalem. Um, also, the final part of this is the idea of a delivery of redemptive sermon, the idea that you will go to a holy place and you will, you know, think of this just future and how you can redeem the world. And often, in the severest cases, we are told of Jerusalem syndrome, then often people adopt this idea of a religious persona, so they might think themselves to be of the prophet, a <coughs> messiah, or specifically Samson, Moses, Christ, or the Virgin Mary. So this is a, a d big discussion that's going on in this idea of, this, is this a real a medical condition? Is this a phenomena? Is this just religious fervour? You know, it is extreme. The Simpsons, who are always on the ball with their satirical what have you, have got a particular episode that's called The Greatest Story Ever Dode, that actually has Homer Simpson um, being taken over by the Jerusalem Syndrome. And this is particularly hard on Ned Flanders, who is his neighbour, who is particularly a devout Christian, and it doesn't affect him, but it affects Homer. And he's been quite irreligious up to this point, and then he believes himself to be the Messiah. Um, and he believes that he's the chosen one and that he's going to unite all religions in this better future by um, this new religion is called the Christmas Jews, so therefore uniting the Abrahamic religions. Um, and he th thought the common denominator would be the idea that everybody would worship peace and chicken, because he yes. thought that was something that suited everybody. So people often laugh at this, quite nervously as well, in my case, in case it happened to me. Um, but also it has been pathologised and basically in the British Journal of Psychology, <coughs> psychiatry rather, the Jerusalem syndrome has become seen as a pathology, as a class, as a, you know, kind of a mental health issue. And it is synonymous with the idea of depersonalisation, that you forget yourself, that you take on a different persona. And the clash is usually seen to be between the idea that people have a very idealised, collective, subconscious image of Jerusalem, and this comes into conflict with the reality of the modern city. And one of the key things that your health is said to depend on is how effectively you bridge your ideal Jerusalem with the reality <coughs> on the ground. So again, this was seen as a phenomenon that in the 80s was on the increase, they feared for the millennium. And to me, it's very interesting because it shows the difference between this idea of heritage as place and heritage as it being in the mind. And the fact, you know, do we bring heritage with us? Do we all have heritage that we bring? 
Or does the place have heritage? Or is it some kind of negotiation between those two? But what was also interesting, since, since I'm interested in uh, heritage and well-being and healers, was the idea that you're, you're at stake here is your health depends on the idea of whether you can possess the city in the way you wish to. So this idea of the possessional act is how you're actually engaging and encountering the place. And of course we know the British have been particularly obsessional with lots of violences underpinning it, particularly in the mandate, over the idea of Jerusalem, both, both old and new. So they have it as this idea of a, you know, kind of a place and also of some, a mobile idea of Jerusalem that they bring to Britain, particularly in the idea of William Blake and the New Jerusalem. So there is this idea of you know, these possessional acts being you know, what would be seen as creative violence in, you know, in scare quotes. So from you know, kind of Helena you know, kind of finding the splinters of the True Cross to the idea of the Palestine Exploration Fund, you know, doing this, having this idea that the real Jerusalem was hidden, it was underground, and this is what we needed to do, was to cut these massive holes and to excavate. Um, again, some of the other um, legacies are things like this, the Muristan, they have this m memorial which is to the Order of St. John, you know, so it was a very much a crusader issue as well. Um, in the um, old city, they also have the Western Wall Tunnel experience where they recreate in quite scary relief the idea of what it would be like if the temple came back again and in doing so they flatten the whole of the Haram al-Sharif. Um, and also, I don't know if people watched the um, start of the Olympics um, and saw how kind of Britishness saw itself connected to Jerusalem and it began with somebody singing William Blake's Jerusalem, and this is supposed to be about Britain, yet they're singing about Jerusalem. Um, and the idea of the NHS as well was seen, the healthcare system was seen as the new Jerusalem um, when the Labour Party was doing some terrible things in Britain. Uh, I mean, in Palestine, they were claiming this kind of moral, you know, kind of leadership in terms of the health service. Um, and also there is this idea of, you know, can you actually transform what the New Jerusalem might be? And I think there were moments of what you would say was post-colonial kind of embracing in things like the opening ceremony. You've got Windrush, which was the idea of the immigrants arriving to Britain and diversity. And you also got things like in the um, uh, Paralympics, the idea of superhuman rather than, you know, the, the idea of disability was the idea of superhuman ability. So I was thinking about all of these ideas, possession, but particularly about dispossession. And this is a picture I took in 2004 where me and Ahmed went round taking pictures of my hero, Edward Said, who had died and I was still in mourning. I got to meet him and to interview him for the first book I wrote on um, Alexandria, and he really is a hero of mine. And I teach everything yes. according to Edward Said, all the books on the it's curriculum, everything. Yeah, sorry about that, but everything is Edward Said. So I was thinking about the op opposite of this, you know, some people want to possess Palestine usually from outside and the, you know, the other side of the coin is the idea of being dispossessed and of course this is what uh, you know, kind of Saeed is trying to talk about with the idea of exile and particularly Palestinian exile. So the idea of uh, exiles feel therefore an urgent need to reconstitute their broken lives usually by choosing to see themselves as part of a triumphant ideology or restored people. So this idea of finding wholeness and is usually the place what, of what heritage does. It's usually that resource that people have for seeking to find you know, a bigger sense of themselves when they feel that you know, they're part of a broken history and the idea of redeeming themselves in a new whole. Also from Saeed's you know, kind of writings, there is this idea of a, a right to a remembered presence that he often writes about that I think is really interesting. And the idea of the right to possess and reclaim a, a collective historical reality. So these are the kinds of things, you know, against the idea of the top-down kind of possessing Palestine, there is this idea of dispossession and potentially repossession. And it's, again, ironic that the um, particular hospital that um, people who suffer the Jerusalem syndrome are taken to is the space which is built on the remains of Deir Yassin. So, you know, there is this proximity between the idea of, you know, this madness <coughs> and this other madness that had occurred and violence. And this is, you know, and again, ironically, it's some of the, most, the best preserved archaeology of Arab villages is here because of this is in the grounds of this kind of mental institution. 
Um, and this is a, one particular intervention, a memorial that they had at Dar Yassin, which is <coughs> names of the victims of the people who were murdered there with their names in Arabic and in Hebrew. So, you know, all of these strange, you know, kind of structures and layers of, of, of you know, different people possessing and un often under violence. And so I also wanted to think about the idea of, um, you know, kind of refugee syndrome. And I wanted to think of this because I was reading about the idea of, you know, kind of what um, Chatty has called the biopolitical route de passage of being a refugee. And it seemed to me to be the antithesis of this idea of uniting and making yourself whole and redeeming the future with the idea of the um, Jerusalem syndrome. It was the idea of being, you know, purposely made into something that was, you know, kind of disintegrated, you know, unsettled, you know, and, and disparate. So when um, Chatty talks about the idea of what it is to be a refugee, the idea is, you know, a cure. The cure is seen to be that you have to integrate, resettle or repatriate people. And of course, the Palestinian um, dilemma, paradox as she calls it, is, uh, as Petit calls it, is a um, unique dilemma. The nature of who is a refugee is, is very, you know, broad in its definition. Um, because most people have been displaced, or who is a displaced person, particularly from 48 and 67. But the idea of, you know, can you rehabilitate, and what does that mean if you're still in a refugee camp after your, you know, kind of family member was, dis you know, kind of forcibly dispersed in 48 or 67. So the idea of, the, you know, reconstituting, reconstituting the refugee in a new lifestyle and persona, again, seems to be this antithesis and the idea that it's a kind of depersonalization in the same way as the Jerusalem syndrome. Um, so again, the idea that uh, people have pathologized the idea of the refugee syndrome as well and made it into this, you know, kind of, um, you know, almost illness that you have to cure. And how can you cure that? Is that by going back to Palestine or going back to your home village? How do you do this? Um, and, you know, this kind of the cornerstone of this being the refugee camp being incredibly problematic. So I wanted to think about these things, you know, possession, dispossession, the Jerusalem syndrome, the, syndrome, the refugee syndrome. And um, Dumani, in an uh, issue of the um, Jerusalem Quarterly, wrote about the idea of um, Palestinian archive fever. And so there's this quote saying it's spreading amongst Palestinians everywhere, whether in Ramallah or London, Haifa or San Francisco, um, Beirut or Riyadh. He says the full dimensions can hardly be imagined. And again, there's this quote, I mean, he uses the idea of archive fever to play on Derrida, who wrote, um, sorry, he uses Palestine fever to, Palestinian archive fever to play on Derrida, who used archive fever, to talk about the idea that the archive is always about the future more than about the past. And I think that's quite an interesting point when we're thinking about heritage. Are we actually thinking about the past? Or are we thinking about we want a past to make claims for us ourselves in the future and our identity? So these, that paper has been very interesting. Um, and he talks about the idea of, you know, people who are displaced, of course, you know, kind of the, the natural thing is to, you know, kind of have this impulse to create archives. Um, but he says, actually, it's even more important in the Palestinian case because it, he says, you know, as he says, 1948 was not a moment but a process and it continues as I write. So he says, a rather like Rewak and you know, other organisations, <coughs> that there are these new archival constellations, as he calls them, and there is this popular desire to create spaces and opportunities for remembrance and commemoration. And he says it's an archiving of the present, not just of the past. And he says this is particularly vital because of the two um, greatest archives are all are being eroded. And he says that is the physical landscape and the bonds of daily life. Um, so he says this is about, you know, this is an opportunity as well to create an archival democracy. So I was interested in that as well, you know, thinking there is something going on. And when I came in 2004 and have been, so I might, I might have got Palestine syndrome in some way, so I keep coming back. Um, so there is this idea, is there something specific about this? And is it that paradox, because it is urgent, that one needs to be vital in in responding to this, and I would say Rewak and many other, you know, kind of organisations, you know, are the epitome of this idea of, you know, I remember going back from my first trip thinking, I wish that English heritage was as quick and as, you know, thoughtful. Oh, there's, there's oh. Um, 
Shall I carry on our break? I carry on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll still be here talking, whatever you do, won't I? I've got slides to get through. So we were just talking about the nature of heritage here and if there was an archive fever and a Palestinian heritage fever going on. Um, and there was this, as some people might remember, there was a, a policy document that I was... Um, asked by UNESCO and the PNA to be involved in Keys to the Past, Keys to the Future, which was creating a national museum policy for Palestine. And some of the key things that came up in this, you know, kind of again, kind of, a, a kind of, what's the word, have correlations with the kinds of organisations on the ground. So the idea that people need inventories, which is exactly what REWAC are doing, that one needs to map, that ne people need to be aware of exactly what is there in terms of heritage, and to protect this in, you know, in an urgent sense. The idea of professionalism was quite an issue as well, because m many people who were active in the heritage realm were laypersons, or they were people who were enthusiasts. And often, you know, professionalism is quite a violent act because you need a lot of money to get the degree or to get the professional. And how can you actually include people who are obviously passionate about this? You know, um, and, and so we were quite concerned about that. Also, the idea that people were interested... And if anybody wants a copy of this, please ask me. I actually then wrote a deconstruction of it because I was a bit... What's the word... Um, concerned that it had been lost in a bin somewhere in UNESCO, <laughs> <laughs> filed under B for bin. Um, but I did write a kind of um, ethnography of the process. Um, but also the idea that people wanted um, heritage to be seen as a living heritage and to be relevant, which again I think, you know, kind of rewack and other organisations are very conscious of. And that often, thank you very much, things were done in terms of the idea of um, heritage being seen as part of a symbolic mapping as well. We were discussing earlier whether UNESCO was um, right or wrong to do things like world heritage listing and whether these were of any value, but symbolically they are a very kind of effective way of putting people on the map. Also, people are interested in the idea that whatever heritage was going to be about, then it had to be linked to education, to educational life chances, and to, to, to capacity building in some way as well. Um, also, the idea that people wanted to connect with the idea of the diaspora, and hopefully a future in which roots tourism will be important to Palestine, and people from the diaspora will come here and to visit the homeland. Um, also, the idea of just futures. So people were very concerned about the idea that, you know, kind of this was going to be used to define, you know, a Palestine in the future that was, you know, kind of um, built on the idea that there is a historical presence, and that was very important to people. And it included like things like statements on uh, the, the, what is now called the Rockefeller Museum, the Occupied Museum in East Jerusalem, and the idea that repatriation and return of that museum as part of a, you know, a Palestinian um, museum uh, complex. So these were the kinds of issues, and if anybody wants this report, I'm very happy to circulate it, and also my <laughs> deconstruction, if that's a polite word to call it afterwards. So again, again, this idea of repossessing Palestine. So again, I would like people, in, when we get to discuss things, is this what's happening now? Is this what you know, REWAC is about? Or is that you know, kind of the listings that you've done as you know, part of, you know, kind of Palestine becoming number 195 in terms of the kind of uh, member states of, the, um, of UNESCO. 
or you know things like PACE, the Palestinian um, Association of Cultural Exchange, Open Bethlehem, all of these things have been interesting in the idea of repossession, I think. Um, and again, you know, kind of buoyed up on this idea of, you know, needed to act. And I was thinking, trying to think of a word that summed it up, and I think vital, you know, vital in terms of it being urgent, but also the idea that it was energetic. Hello, no, <laughs> come join us. Um, so there was this idea that situations of extremis, there is this remodelling of um, heritage, and we were discussing Chiara de Cesare's article about how she saw rewack about you know this idea of the future, if you like. So you know, and again, I would like your opinions on things like that. Um, and I'm doing okay for time, so I want to now go across to Jordan and think about repossession there. And again, I would be very interested in the idea of how you think that this might be similar or different to the idea of you know, West Bank and Gaza and this act of repossession. So the idea is, is there a refugee heritage fever or syndrome? I mean, is it bad for you? These things are double-edged. I mean, the, you know, the Jerusalem syn syndrome, depending on who says, you know, is talking about it, is either you know, a great you know, expression of religious devotion, or it means you're mad, you know, and it's actually, you know, kind of, some kind of illness. So I wanted to think about this, and all, all, obviously there is this kind of paradoxical role um, of heritage in this situation, because in a sense you've lost your heritage, you are outside Palestine, you are in a refugee camp, but you also bring heritage with you, so what is heritage, and... How do you acknowledge that and how do you con keep connections with the homeland? Um, so this is the idea that, you know, we start with the idea that we, you know, wanted to challenge the assumed absence of heritage in the refugee camp, which is often stated, and the idea that from the symbolic heritage to the everyday, this obviously exists and it's performed, it's reworked, it's, you know, kind of part of, you know, everyday life. Um, also, the idea that you know heritage is bound up in creating the paradox, you know, the kind of you know problem of the idea of being in a, wanting to go back to the homeland as well. So there is a really paradoxical aspect. But the idea that identity, you know, is bound up in the idea of who you are, what your origin is, where you come from. But also place making. So how do you place make if you think you are outside of you know your um, the place where you wish to be. Also the idea of well-being, how is well-being performed? And often people, again, talking to people in refugee camps, they will talk about their kind of strategies or rituals of comfort or coping strategies that relate back to the idea of being Palestinian and what that means and how that helps them cope. Also psychosocial um, perspectives on this, the idea that you know, kind of well-being is bound up in things like religion, is based up in the idea of family, it's based in the, you know, these kinds of networks of what you might call habitus that we are born into. But also the idea that you won't wish to commemorate pasts, and I shall show some examples, and again, claim futures, just futures. Usually this is bound up, as we will see, in the idea of the right of return. Um, so I didn't do this on my own. I definitely needed my per the person I was working with, who is Dr. Fatima Namari, who is um, at uh, Petri University. Um, and she used to work with UNRWA as a camp improvement officer in Jordan. So she was well placed academically and also had this background in knowing the camps and, you know, kind of going there. So we also didn't want to just go into a camp and say, what is heritage, what do you think? We actually went to places where we knew people were already thinking about this. Talbeya camp, which is um, just outside Amman airport, really, was one of the first to actually respond to this. They have an amazing heritage um, centre, which is in the women's centre. They have this heritage project. And they were interested in doing oral histories and they were interested in thinking about this idea of the refugee camp as heritage as well. So this is um, one of the sessions that we were doing on oral history. Um, so this is some of the kind of blurb that UNRWA uses about um, the Talbeya camp, one of the six emergency camps set up in 1968. Um, you probably know all of this. I don't know how familiar people are with the different refugee camps. But, the, you know, when they're kind of citing the problems there, early marriage and divorce, poverty and unemployment, absence of green spaces and open play spaces, 
irregular jobs, no social security or health insurance schemes. So there are all of these kinds of issues and, you know, kind of placed in a quite a, a small space. There's more than 7,000 re registered refugees um, there. So we wanted to try and find out, to um, organise workshops, and we've done quite a few of these now, um, and to look at this idea of, you know, is there a heritage fever? What does this repossession mean? What are the themes, the issues and concerns that were raised? And when you just mentioned the idea of heritage, it's not surprising that people talk about Palestine. Palestine is the first, you know, being Palestinian, talking about Palestine is the central, it's the axis mundi, it's the centre part of the cosmology that people talk about. And it is reimagined and it's remade by people when they talk about it and it's about themselves but it's also about, you know, the kind of more collective ideas. Um, as I'll talk about, there's definitely gendered responses to the idea of what heritage is, um, the idea of identifying certain places as well that are part bound up in heritage, um, and the idea of um, memories as well is, is very um, part, you know, interesting. The idea of who has a memory of Palestine, uh, you know, kind of is very important. That's kind of seen as more authentic. Um, and what does that mean to you if you're kind of remembering Palestine secondhand or via Google now, which a lot of people do, and what does that mean to people's idea of the place? Also, the idea of transmitting um, heritage. People, again, are very much interested in different archives, so I will talk about them in a moment. And um, particularly this pa um, paradox that people are, you know, kind of situated in where they're <coughs> in a kind of permanent impermanence, you know, the idea of, you know, Will we get back to Palestine? When will we? You know, now the fourth generation of people are born in camps in Jordan. Is that effectively where people are going to live? But again, there was this idea of, you know, kind of better futures. You know, people were, you know, discussing how you could use heritage to, you know, bring about a better future. But again, you know, the ultimate cure was seen as the right of return. So the first thing that, you know, kind of came up with the idea of heritage is that people use, and I'm sorry, I've tried to learn Arabic three times now and I've failed. My English is quite bad because I'm a northerner, so I've, even my Queen's English has never worked. Um, but people connect, use the term Turaf. Thank you. Um, uh, and that's the first thing people use as their, you know, kind of terminology. And it's usually used in a kind of duality. There's a double vision between the idea of a bigger idea of Palestine and then the family village. So if you talk to people, they will say, yes, I'm Palestinian and this is my family village. Um, so Palestine is the centre of the network. When you're asking them who they are, Palestine is at the centre, but it's outside somewhere. People will talk about Palestine and point, you know. Um, but there's also this idea of feeling very uh, much part of the idea of a family village. And again, most people haven't finished, bleh, visited this or been there, but see themselves as, as inextricably linked to this. So again, one of the key things that people identify when you say, so what is heritage, is the idea of the dresses. So, you know, somebody we, in, we, we spoke to in one of the workshops talked about the unique fingerprints of Palestinian heritage being the dresses. And again, that idea that you can tell from the dresses, the idea of which village it is, or different, you know, kind of um, ideas about who the person is. Um, you could read, basically, you know, the dresses was very important to people. And when we talked to them about this, obviously they valued the idea of the authentic dress, the ones that managed to come from Palestine, even though that was very difficult when people, obviously, particularly in 48, had to, you know, kind of leave things behind. So even talking about heritage is often lost objects. But people very much valued these, but also remade them. So often they took the front panel and sewed it onto a new dress, or they remade things, and so you can get these <coughs> collections that people have. And in the refugee camps where they have little space, it's quite interesting that people choose to use that space to, you know, kind of collect things on top of each other. Um, so that was one of the other things. Also, people talk about, you know, heritage in that kind of souvenir sense, that, you know, it's from somewhere else, and use metaphors and metaphorical weight, and often use this to give moral ethical resonances. And a lot of people writing, you know, about heritage um, and about kind of linguistics or, you know, kind of uh, discussions of how people just speak about things, say that metaphor is often turned to if it's an incident which you can't quite articulate because it's very emotional or it's significant to you in some way. So metaphor is often used 
you compare it to something else. So when we had a workshop and we asked people to bring in objects, one woman brought in a weighing measure, as she called it, a weighing meter like this. And she said this was traditional, it was domestic, and it was about everyday life. But she also said it was a reminder of justice. You know, there was always that, also that metaphorical idea there. Um, olives, as you might expect, and olive trees came up a lot in the idea of, you know, what objects, you know, kind of um, were synonymous with um, Palestine. There were visions of rural life. The idea that one man who, who talked about the idea that, that it was his connection with the home in Ramallah, which he said was famous for olives. It got very competitive as to who had the best olives, and there were a few fights about this that um, emerged. Um, but also, again, with the metaphor, he said, Palestine is like an olive tree, and the roots of the olive tree are deep in the earth, and he compared this to his family's deep roots in the Ramallah area and all Palestinians' deep roots in Palestine. So you have that double layering, Ramallah and Palestine. And people collapse the idea of the object person boundaries as well to give that depth of origins, belonging, and stressing the resilience and steadfastness of humans you know, with such symbolic objects. So the same person said, the leaves of the olive tree are always green in winter and summer. They are always ready for growth and giving plenty. So the idea that, you know, I remember the sculpture that you had outside Birze, with the gallery in Birze of the olive tree as well. So, you know, this idea that this has become symbolic, you know, this is, this is you know, has a, you know, almost over-determined, you know, kind of resonance to it. But also the idea of heritage as faith, and this is something that often a Eurocentric model of heritage kind of disallows. You know, heritage is supposed to be a kind of secular version of what was once religious, and you get the whole idea of, you've been through my lectures, Aunt Red, the whole idea of, you know, kind of secularisation of kind of, you know, the emergence of state and needing state rituals. Those state rituals are the heritage spaces. But there is a turnaround to recognise that the West isn't the world, thank goodness, um, and the idea that many people have religious value in terms of heritage. And so things like enchanted heritage are often cited, and you know the idea of understanding sacred heritage. I'm sure you're familiar with all of these things. So the idea that you know heritage is faith, religion, and peace. Um, so again, another quote, the olive, like Palestinian heritage and Palestinians itself, is sacred and has religious values and meaning. So people put the idea of value, we were talking about heritage value before, but, you know, and extend it from the object to yourself. Um, the olive it's, itself has religious value and features in the Quran. As Muslims and faith are very much connected with religious value and our homeland connects us with our history and our faith. So there is this idea as well, the same person who spoke about this said that their heritage was not territorial or, um, and it was non-sectarian as well. Whatever the monument of civilization is, and whether it is Muslim or not, it is part of our achievement, it is positive. And so they said this against the idea of a, you know, a specific heritage, you know, for example, um, Israel wishing to find Jewish heritage, but the idea that everything is you know, kind of uh, bound up in the heritage of Palestine. Um, also, the idea of the olive branch of a, a symbol of peace internationally, and like many people, and as in the thing that the, the report that we did for um, the PNA and UNESCO, often people talked about the peace industry. So peace was seen as a very devalued in terms of the peace process, you know, kind of idea. But the idea of reclaiming peace in some way could be done. <coughs> So, and this brought um, a kind of emergence of different people within the refugee camps talking. So one of them was a Syrian refugee who talked about, um, and this was a Syrian refugee in the Palestinian refugee camp in Talbaya, who said, um, as an Arab and a, uh, as a Muslim, part of our faith is to be attached to Palestine. So it is not only those who have been removed from their homes for whom it matters, but Palestine is holy for each Muslim. Jerusalem has a religious value as it was the first direction of prayer. Therefore, it is a matter of faith to preserve it and to keep it safe, to, to keep it safe, to defend it and to make it into a place of peace. So even if I am not Palestinian, as a Muslim, I am outraged at the occupation. And so this kind of gave um, people the opportunity to talk about non-Palestinians within the refugee camp, which, first of all, wasn't a kind of issue, but once 
you know, kind of so people talked about the Syrians who had come recently, also um, Egyptians who were often migrant workers, Iraqi um, refugees as well. So you've got much more of a diversity of who, who was part of this kind of, you know, kind of heritage space, if you like. Also the idea that this was about, you know, kind of different ideas of suffering and resilience. So the idea of the Nakba and the idea this brought people on, you know, talk about the actual event of, of you know, kind of dispossession, whether it was 48, 67, or whether it was from the ongoing, you know, kind of um, uh, dispossessions. So, and people kind of summed up this kind of, again, dualism between the idea of Palestine being a source of pride and inspiration, but also a heavy burden. And the idea that we think that Palestine was the light that lit up the world, but also was a problem that is always present, pers present and persistent as long as we are in the camp. Um, so there is this idea of heritage pride as a source for well-being, but also this sense of burden and ill-being. And this was some, one of the artists um, in one of the camps who had, you know, kind of based all this artwork on this idea of, you know, kind of um, suffering. So there is this idea, and you know, I, I was meeting 16-year-olds, particularly in, in uh, Jirash or the Gaza camp, who said, you know, I'm 16, but I feel like I'm 60 years old. I've got this weight, you know, on my shoulders, and you know, this kind of history that I should, you know, be taking on, you know. And and so there was this discussions about is that good or bad for you, and what is that kind of burden, and, and you know, how does one cope with that? Also, the idea of lost objects. Um, lost persons as well, lost homes. So the experiences of displacement were, you know, kind of came to the fore. So Palestine, of course, was the ultimate lost object. The idea that we lost Palestine was the kind of key thing that people spoke about. And also the elders, there are still people from 48 Alive who were talking about their experience. And they were all obviously seen as auth authentic narrators. You know, they were victims of this of some of them combatants as well. So this is a, a quote from somebody who said that he was 15 years old um, and remembered the first night, it being the first night of Ramadan when the attack was happened on his village um, and his, his and the neighbouring families fled in their night dresses. He says it wasn't possible to carry all the children and four within the village were left behind. So there's this idea, you know, we left people behind. You know, you're talking about objects. You know, this is, this is you know, kind of... A, much more um, weighty than this. Um, also, the idea of um, uh, he went then to a, a, a UNRWA camp near um, Hebron. And he talks about the blizzards, the tents falling down, of course, the snowstorms as well. That's synonymous with the aftermath of this, bringing more hardship. So the idea of another camp, and people talk about displacement and displacement and displacement, and the idea of suf suffering much poverty, having to live live off a bushel of dates and water. Um, and again, finally coming to, you know, kind of um, Jordan. Um, I came to um, Talbaya, moving back and forth to the Jordan Valley, during which the second <coughs> blizzard, took, blizzard took hole, bringing more extremists. And then the person who was narrating this summed up by saying, to put a long story short, it is a life of suffering. So there are all these different narratives going on and... Um, a, the idea of kind of capturing particularly oral histories of these are very important as well, particularly as a kind of transgenerational thing, so it's usually school children who are doing the recording. Um, also the idea of, you know, kind of transmitting memories. So again, people who went through 48 and 67 were seen as, you know, part of, you know, authentic memories of those times and had seen the formation of the camp. Um, and that they were the people, you know, to, to keep alive those memories and to keep them um, kind of on record, as it were, part of the archive. And the idea, particularly, that it was going to show the same sense of pain, anguish, trauma, but also the idea of it being an in, on, ongoing injustice. People were very concerned that it would still be an agenda and that they were there to, in a sense, personify that. Um, also, this idea of the, the being in the kind of um, labels of the refugee and Palestinian, you know, kind of being part of the discussions of identity and what does that mean? What does it mean to be a refugee? What does it mean to be Palestinian? And again, this idea of, you know, leaving things behind often came up, you know, the idea or having to sell things, even of the families who managed to take things with them, the idea that, you know, you had often had to sell things because you didn't have much money. 
So all of these discussions were going on in the different workshops, particularly with the discussion for the elders we had. But also you've got this idea of objects of desire. Often when I asked people, you know, did they have anything to bring into the workshops, often people would say, I don't, but this is what I would bring if I could. Um, and I thought this was quite an interesting one that um, when I, we asked one person what he would bring to the workshop, he says, if I had, a, you know, the object I would really like would be the dream of return and a prayer in Jerusalem. So his object that he brought to the workshop was very imaginatively a prayer in Jerusalem. So they talked about the idea of the dream of going back and the idea of particularly, you know, the, being preoccupied with this and the overwhelming power of the dream of returning home. Um, to spend your entire life thinking about this and what that meant and how that meant, you know, in terms of the idea of living in the camp and four generations of people being there. Also, the idea of, you know, kind of how do you bring Palestine to the camp? Am I all right to keep on talking? Yeah. Uh, how do you bring... So there is this kind of magical thinking, the idea of bringing the camp to you, particularly through the idea of food. And often here, women, it was a very gendered thing, that homemaking and placemaking was often something that the women did, particularly through the idea of cooking. So this idea of the sensorium, the idea of being able to smell you know, the food or what have you and to keep that going was very important. So people, you know, talked about the idea of what they would, you know, kind of how they would like to, as it were, commune with um, uh, Palestine. And, and so people talked about the idea of seeing, for example, Jerusalem or their home village, to kiss the earth, to smell, uh, to smell, you know, kind of Palestine. And often people said, you know, I used to, you know, the rural smell would be lovely, but here, you know, we don't have the capacity to grow things of our own or to eat the food. So we had one person from Jericho saying he wanted to eat the famous yellow figs. Is that true? Is there famous yellow figs? In yellow figs. Yeah, he believed so. And he's, he's, in Jericho, he's, has in Jericho. <laughs> well, he, but well, you don't want to go there. I, I, what's the word? This is this is what's interesting though. <laughs> <laughs> but so but it's interesting that, that people build up in their minds that the fruit is better, that all of the things grow better in Palestine. Um, and it's particularly their particularly their home village. So one dent challenged the idea that the yellow figs of Jericho um, aren't but they are better and more superior. So there's this real idealised status that is going on. And the idea in the camp, there are few opportunities to grow their own food. So the idea of kind of... Have you worked out where they're from? I think he's talking not about the fig, but the Jumeis has a small village like figs. And the Jumeis is a thousand years. Gaza and the coastal field, but not in Jericho. It's like oh, Arsenal yeah. versus. <laughs> kind of. uh, this is how it got. Honestly, people would say, no, my village is, you know, what have you. So it got very much like this. But people like the idea of, you know, kind of, they wish they could take in the air and scenery of Palestine and the idea that, you know, doing that was good for the mind and the body, you know, eating the same kind of um, foods. But then it got to the extremes. People got very competitive and one man said, I'd like to eat the soil of Palestine if I could go there. I, and it is that ultimate idea of communing, you know. Um, and he said, um, you know, he'd brought seeds from Palestine and he would be prepared to cut himself and nourish these seeds with his own blood. This is exactly the kind of, uh, what's the word, reaction he got by the rest of the people in the <laughs> workshop. But it did get very competitive, you know, this idea of, how, you know, how would you, what would you do for Palestine and how would you commune with it? Um, you know, how would you take it in literally by eating it, eating the soil? Um, so there is this idea of, you know, again, my hero Edward Said has talked about the idea of writing to the moment. So there is something about heritage to the moment. What kind of, you know, kind of relevant heritage would you, you know, uh, have? And he talks about the idea of the arts of memory, going back to the Greek arts of memory, um, and the idea of having a mind palace um, and how you remembered things. And um, many people talked about the idea of those people who remembered Palestine or remembered their village or who had got 
which is obviously very difficult, permission to return as well. And so the idea of what they did when they got back, so one person said, you know, when you've got permission to visit, the first thing I insist on doing is walking on foot around Jericho. It's the first city in the world and it is my heritage. So there's this idea of active repossession and remembering. And so he re re recreates the old Jericho that he knows. And he says, I would go around and say, this is the house of so-and-so. I remember the people in the places connected to the fields, the other buildings and the landscapes. And he says, on the last visit, he took his family and he went to Shisham's palace in Tel Sultan. Um, and to Jerusalem to see the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. And so his object that he brought was his photograph album and all of these kinds of things. Um, so there is this idea that people often, when they come back, there is such a big um, pressure on them to enjoy themselves and to come back and say it was beautiful and the figs were brilliant in Jericho and they were bigger than here even in, in Jordan. But also the, the idea that some people have a really traumatic time when they come back. So another person said, you know, it was a very traumatic episode and they said they felt their dispossession was even greater when they went back. Um, so they said they, they confronted home as an occupied space and visiting home and seeing the IDF all over the place made my blood boil. I was also shocked at the ongoing humilia humiliations of occupation. He added, the settlers in Hebron harassed the locals, they spat on them. Um, coming from here, I couldn't believe it. Um, it is a shock to see Palestinian dignity um, treated in this way. Um, I, am, I almost passed out when I saw this happening. So there is, you know, the different, you know, ideas and people, it's, it's almost too overdetermined, you know, your idea of people patting on your back, well, well done, you've got, you know, your permission to go there. And the idea of whether it's, a, you know, a, 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 an act of, you know, kind of well-being or not depends on, the, you know, what people take on. But it's also the idea of curating Palestine, the idea that people have their own organic ideas of what they're collecting and how that's being collected. So there is this imperative of memory, an imperative to remember in some way. So there is no formal um, museum, for example, in Talbaya, but there is this idea that people have an inventory of objects. They have a list that people you know, know who's got what, and they are borrowed on trust when anybody wants to do an exhibition. So they know individual collectors, you know, who are just people who have gathered things together or inherited. So this kind of crossed over the idea of a private or a public or a personal or collective um, collection or boundaries by having this. So there was somebody from Beersheba who had pots, headdresses, traditional carpets and maps as well of the place. And his friends joked, it is almost a museum that he has, it's his hobby. So there are certain people who have got these things and again, kind of titles and deeds. And it's also we talked about the, you know, the kind of iconic keys that, you know, of return. Mm -hmm. And again, this kind of brought up the question of diversity as well. And, and one of the people we interviewed, viewed said, people from Jericho and Ramallah have big keys that some managed to bring with them, but many people who came here to Talbaya were Bedouin who lived in tents and therefore you don't need to have, they didn't have keys to bring. He reiterated, not all people have the same heritage, some have very different heritage, some have items and traditions relating to Jericho and Ramallah, some related to um, the Bedouin from Beersheba culture. Each camp feels it is different and each camp and each of the camps are, um, are unique due to their composition. So you've got a sense of who came from where, the kind of particular mix of each of the different camps through you know, the objects as well. Um, so these are just examples of personal collections. Oh, God, it's a bit technical when it gets to there, isn't it? There's the different colours in there. Um, so this is Wedat camp, um, which is in the, more or less the centre of Amman. Um, and they feel that they are symbolic of all Palestinian camps, you know, kind of, um, and they, they are kind of projecting, as they see it, Palestinian, you know, identity, and almost see themselves as a kind of, you know, kind of, yeah, marker for doing this. And this is an, a, a person who we came across who is an, actually an optician, but when he found out we were interested in heritage, he took us to an optician shop and then got out all of these objects from Palestine, and I just said, oh, you know, you must have a lot of, um, uh, you know, kind of space to do this. You know, you, you know, it's getting rather full. You know, what's going to happen there? And he just says, my house is even worse. I've got a house and my wife doesn't want me to collect anymore. But he actively, you know, collected these. He was a poet, so 
Mahmoud Darwish was, you know, one of the kind of other kind of connectivities he had with the idea of being Palestinian. So you get these people who, in all of the different camps, who just collect, you know, and collect things. Also the idea of um, Bakar camp, the idea, and I was asking, you know, how each camp saw themselves. So if, you know, kind of, you know, kind of, you know, kind of Wedat saw itself as symbolic of all the camps, then Bakar Bank camp saw itself as a political barometer of all things in Palestine. So they said, if you wanted to know what was going on in Palestine, the news got to there <laughs> first, and they said that they were one of the most politicised camps. So, particularly compared to Talbeya, which designated themselves as traditional. Um, so the idea of actually having, you know, kind of um, murals like this on the wall in Talbeya camp, they were seen to be not appropriate and they didn't want to have these things and they thought it might be problematic to the Jordanian authorities if they did. But at the back of our camp, this was the idea, this is what we do. And they said, we see ourselves as little Palestines, you know, and every street reminds you of Palestine. They did name some of the streets, and again, as you probably know, in some camps you're able to name things officially, in other camps it's seen as, you know, in, you know not done. Um, but people do have this kind of naming system there. Um, but this is one of the kind of murals there. And the idea, again, at the back of our camp was this idea of the artists who are, you know, kind of um, doing both commemorative artwork, but also this idea, the same artist here was also doing these murals at the schools as well. And I thought it was interesting that one of the local schools had, again, the Palestinian dress as part of its kind of... Um, school mission, the idea of you know educating people for the future, but they used it with the idea that we're Palestinian from the past with the dress, if you like. Um, the Hussun camp, um, the idea of who they said the the um, uh, neighbouring villages spoke the, of them as the Valley of the Wolves, and they said they had this kind of you know stigma attached to them as refugees, but they used it as a badge of pride as well, you know. Um, and this was a case where they said, you know, kind of there is this, you know, paradox that we love and we hate our camp. Do you know what I mean? We, we hate it because we're here, but we, we're, we're here <laughs> and we have to, you know, kind of um, um, engage with this, you know, as an everyday landscape. And this was one of the things that we came across when we were at this camp was the idea of this scheme that was trying to get particularly um, young people to paint, to be, you know, painters and decorators, and it was seen that there's some nice colours that we could do, you can have it purple or, you know, and, um, but it was seen as very bad and that it couldn't continue because they didn't look like a refugee camp anymore. And so it was banned and the idea that this couldn't continue because sponsors would be put off giving money, donors would be put off um, giving money to a camp that looked like it was doing well for itself. And again, you know, particularly in the idea that the Syrian refugees now, people felt themselves in a very competitive space in terms of, you know, kind of who was going to fund. Um, so again, this kind of idea of the refugee identity brings discrimination, shame, but it's also re resistance and pride, and people talked about that kind of, again, that paradox. And also young people are very much interested in the history of the camp itself, um, so, you know, camps now have a heritage in the sense that whether it's 48 or 67. So people were interested in things like the corrugated, you know, kind of um, iron, not so much the asbestos that is still around, but the idea of, you know, and also older people have different mental maps of where things were um, in a camp. So people were trying to do kind of geographies and mappings of camps. Also the idea of recreating heritage, so as, you know, kind of this is... Um, uh, the women's programme at the Hussun camp, where, again, people are doing, you know, going back to their kind of traditional um, uh, sewing as, as part of their kind of economic money-making making enterprises, particularly at the women's centre. Um, so, again, kind of tradition as part of, you know, new for, you know, economics of the future. But tradition was also another term that was used alongside um, heritage. And tradition seemed to be, I mean, it could be interchangeable, but it also was there to indicate intangible or folk life. And also it connoted or it conveyed an idea of moral ethical behaviours as well. And um, so in the Talbeya camp, you know, the people there said, you know, there's a certain conservatism that come along with the tradition of the Talbeya camp. It's mixed with a religious kind of um, moral ethical um, framework here. 
Um, and the women's groups there said, you know, kind of, um, we're here to challenge the stereotypes at some level as well and saw it very much as, you know, kind of gendered. So they said why they're pr while they're proud of their traditions, it also is restrictive. So again, this woman in Talbea said it's a, um, the Talbea was very traditional, a, a source of great pride, but also a paradox for female members of the camp. She argued that tradition is important to us, but sometimes it affects us females negatively. And they spoke a lot about the idea of, you know, kind of going to either national or international um, women's groups, um, particularly representing Palestine as something that was about self-esteem, and a lot of women felt quite empowered by this. Um, but it also became a, an issue when we were talking about um, performance from Dabke to rap. Um, there was this idea of, you know, kinds of, can women perform in public? And at the Talbeya camp, that had become a problem, with the idea of being in choirs and performing. Um, but when I was there as well, particularly Arab Idol, I'm sorry, I don't know his name. That's the big thing. What was that? <laughs> But there were a few 13... Got 67 million votes. Uh, <laughs> of an obvious winner. And, but I, there were 13 and 14-year-old girls who couldn't stop talking about Arab Idol and Jordan. Um, so obviously this idea, and they were very proud, you know, this has shown that, you know, kind of, you know, Palestinians have this tradition of performance and singing and... Um, so we had these special performances put on for us as well. Um, but also the idea that, and rap was a very big, that was seen to be a medium where you could update, if you like, the, the old genres of, you know, kind of Palestinian kind of, you know, kind of folk songs. So rap was being used as quite an important aspect of this and highly political as well in some contexts. Um, but also people were talking about this idea that uh, particularly the young people in their workshops there were saying that while their parents and grandparents may have battled in terms of, you know, traditional conflict, they said their battle is with the media and with representation. And it was quite interesting how many people wished to go in for filmmaking and for all of these kinds of, you know, kind of to challenge the stereotypes. And they had a big project, which was very interesting at Talbeya Camp, where young people kind of challenged the stereotypes so they would recreate picture, the pictures, the photographs of 48 um, uh, refugees with the UN bags and what have you, and they would create them, you know, recreate them with their jeans on, going like this with their <laughs> Arab idol, you know, <laughs> things have changed, you know, and, you know, and this idea that, you know, there is this kind of, you know, pity that comes from the, you know, you have to look pitiful to get the pity, to get the money and what have you, and they said, we want, you know, this to end, this is a, you know, a stereotype. So it's a lot cheaper to go to your new camp and photograph people going again outside. Yeah, well, well yes, we, 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 yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> unfortunately this doesn't stop. Um, and uh, another aspect of Wed Act Camp was the idea of the football shirt, because they are proudly, the, you know, kind of, does people support? No. Yes. Wed Act yes. Camp, yes. yeah. Yes. So I was told that while I was there I must buy a t-shirt, <laughs> which is too big for my cat, which I gave him it for, but, <laughs> but it's, it's, um, this is seen as part of the heritage. Um, heritage placemaking, you know, the idea of the Jirash or the Gaza camp, which has probably even less, in a sense, rights because they were the displaced of the displaced who came in 67 and have even less official documents than any of the other uh, refugees. So it's just next to, you know, Jirash camp, which next to Petra is the biggest heritage site in Jordan and yet they are still only had the, the drainage tunnels being dug in while I was there in um, September, the last camp to have the drainage put in and they still have a lot of the corrugated yeah. and people wanted to save these in the Talbeya camp because they were nearly a thing of the past, people wanted to archive these um, whereas in the kind of Jirash camp it's just like we've still got them, can you please change them um, also, viewing points. This was something really interesting. Um, when I asked people about, you know, kind of what they did on their days off, or you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of what they did to, um, yeah, kind of their, their strategies of comforting themselves, or whatever it might be, or leisure. And most people said if they wanted to, um, you know, kind of relax or whatever, 
or even keep feel connected to Palestine, they would go to a viewing point. So, so it's this kind of promised land thing again. So, um, you know, there was this idea, idea of Mount Nebo being a key one of them, which is, of course, where Moses saw the promised land from. So people said they often went to Mount Nebo to look across and to see, you know, kind of Palestine. Also, in case, um, the idea, so while we were there... Sorry. As you know, Ahmed, you've tried hard with my accent and <laughs> it's, it's rejected it again, I'm sorry. Um, so the idea, and when I was talking to people here, they said, you know, family groups would come here and they just said it comforted them that, that when it was sunrise here, it was also sunrise in Palestine. Um, so this idea of just seeing, you know, was an act of possession, if you like, possessing Palestine. And um, when I started with this idea of the Jerusalem syndrome, and you know, is it an illness or is it, you know, well-being or what does it mean to be connected or obsessional about our heritage? In the in the Jadrash, the Gaza camp, I was talking to the, them about this whole idea of um, the Jerusalem syndrome, and uh, one of the people there, the young boys there, said, um, "We're actually." <coughs> beyond psychology here, he said he studied psychology because he wanted to try and understand what was happening. And again, you know, kind of the education, I mean, people, are, you know, kind of uh, very much um, wish to, you know, kind of engage in education to get better life chances. And he says, and we're beyond this, beyond the category of refugee as well, you know, they saw themselves as the lowest of the low. We have no rights, we have no identity cards. He says, but what we are is analysts. And he says, young people here have a heavy burden. And he says, he says, you know, we have this idea that we analyse the situation every which way. He says, you know, we just obsessively think about, you know, what is going to be the future and what the different futures may be. You know, is this occupation still there or is there going to be, a, you know, an end to this? So this idea of the heavy burden and what that might mean. And as people have made mention of, you know, the kind of Syria... There's these, as Saeed would say as well, there are new besieged constituencies. So while we were there, you know, the Zatari camp and all of the other camps that the Syrians are going to. And um, there was amazing acts of inclusion. So many people within the Palestinian refugee camps are, you know, amazing acts of kindness, giving you know, kind of refuge to people, sharing resources with people. There's a project in Hassan camp that's organised by the young people to get uh, a, an infant school for the Syrian children there because they've been two years without schooling there. But also there's this worry, it's competitive, you know, will all the money be going here and not to um, us as well? So I just wanted to kind of end on this slide with the idea of are there new heritage fevers with new displacements? You know, and there's this hospitality, as I say, but also the fear of competition. And it was quite interesting that I was just looking at how people at the Zatari camp were engaging with this, and people were doing lots of handprints as part of this. But even the tents, they had a kind of evil eye to protect them on one of the tents, you know, and scenes as well of, you know, kind of um, Syria there as well. So they were really kind of bringing home with them. And they were actually organising the camp to be in different spaces from different villages in Syria as well. So I would like to leave it there and Ahmed will say a few things and <coughs> open it up and what people think about this idea of possessing Palestine and are you all gripped by heritage fever or not or, you know, what do you think of all of these things? Thank, thank you very much. I really would like to, to thank my... my my professor, actually, <laughs> uh, Beverly, for this in informative, this informative uh, intervention. Uh, really, it's um, an intellectual uh, intervention about uh, the cultural heritage, and you know, this 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 subject is very uh, very soph sophisticated. I uh, let's say, and it uh, uh, especially when we speak about Palestinian cultural heritage, here always we have. Uh, two sides, actually, and I, I, I speak the conflict here. Conflict of. Thank you. Uh, so uh, always we have uh, two sides. Uh, 
here, the Israeli side and the Palestinian side. And uh, each side has, uh, has let's say, uh, his narrative and history. And trying, this is, you know, the conflict, uh, the conflict, let's say, on narratives, on history, and each side tries really to possess this this history and take it uh, to his uh, to his side. Uh, indeed, it's it's not easy to uh, to discuss uh, this this topic, and it's not easy for me as as a discussant to to do this, this work alone. I think all together we can uh, discuss it uh, with Beverly uh, and. Uh, I, I just uh, would like uh, here uh, to see if, uh, if you uh, allow me just uh, might be to hi highlight uh, some points here in, uh, uh, in the lecture. So as I said before, okay, we have the Palestinians uh, and Palestinians. Indeed, uh, we can speak about different Palestinians. Okay, Palestinians living, still living in Israel now, Palestinian living in Gaza, Palestinian living in West Bank, and in uh, in Jordan and other places. I mean, in the Arab world, in the camps and out of the camps, and then uh, outside the Arab world, as might be refugees or not refugees. But uh, uh, here, you know, the the most the most important about uh, cultural heritage uh, and. Uh, I can say the trauma, let's say, of our cultural heritage and how we uh, try to use our uh, cultural heritage to, uh, let's say, insist and preserve our identity either inside Palestine <coughs> or outside Palestine. And might be how, uh, let's uh, say, how uh, we make our image, okay, uh, the image of Palestine inside the camps and you know, uh, I think, uh, Beverly, uh, the image uh, inside, let's say, West Bank or Gaza and outside completely might be, I think, completely different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, in the refugee camps, uh, the image now, I, I can say it's the dream. Mm -hmm. The dream of coming back to, to, to Palestine and uh, this, this image has been Let's, uh, let's say, made since uh, decades now, mm -hmm. okay? And mostly completely different. Uh, I think we have, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, we have to, uh, let's say, uh, try to think about that and uh, uh, think about, you know, the continuous trauma of our, uh, uh, our cause. Uh, as Fuldon said, okay, uh, no, you said something important, which is uh, in Syria, okay, the Yarmouk, the Yarmouk camp, okay. Now, you know, this image might be distorted sometimes, might be, uh, you know, preserved and, preserved and insisted, okay, uh, to preserve uh, the Palestinian uh, identity. Uh, so, uh, so as, as you know, uh, here we have you know, uh, the image, uh, this is the Palestinian side, and uh, how we can understand now um, the Palestinian image, the Palestinian narrative, the Palestinian history, and how the Palestinians now uh, uh, use, let's say, their cultural heritage, their, their history, their narrative itself, uh, and whether they use it to insist uh, their right of this land or not, uh, whether in Jordan they use it for the, the same uh, purpose or not. In the diaspora, I mean, okay, how they think about, uh, uh, about this issue. And uh, then, uh, you see, if you take the other side, I mean, if you take the other side, uh, the Israelis try to, you know, to use this heritage uh, in different way. Either the intangible or the tangible heritage. Okay, they might, let's say, damage the, uh, the tangible heritage, okay, physically, let's say, but whether they succeed to damage our intangible heritage, as we were said, okay, Muhammad Asaf, okay, when he succeed might be an Arab idol, he used the national, actually, songs, the national dancing, the dabka, and 
Okay, uh, all these symbols. Uh, so whether the occupation uh, succeed uh, to damage uh, this, in this image, uh, our intangible heritage, or even tangible. And uh, okay, uh, we saw uh, different, let's say, examples, uh, either from Hebron, from Jerusalem, uh, and if you visit Hebron, you will see what's going on there. Okay, you will see that uh, uh, the Israeli settlers now, for instance, uh, they are uh, conducting uh, an excavation, trying to uh, to find some physical, let's say, evidence for their their narrative about uh, Hebrew, about uh, cultural heritage, and uh, you know all all such uh, such aspects. Uh, so I think um, I'm, I'm not going, you know, to speak about you know. Uh, all the aspects, but uh, if you take uh, uh, the Palestinian, let's say, uh, dresses, the Palestinian embroidery, and uh, the Palestinian, uh, uh, let's say, uh, local cuisine, all, all of these uh, uh, issues which are part of the cultural heritage, and uh, uh, the Israelis try to use them in order to create their, their cultural heritage because, you know, they lack. The, uh, the cultural identity, since uh, the identity uh, created uh, a throw uh, cultural heritage, so they have to, uh, to forge uh, this heritage in order to uh, create their, uh, their national identity. Uh, so uh, I think this is all of this, I, I can stop here and give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you.